Speak the charm of make charm of make charm. Come a time on the planet Earth when science and technology will be long forgotten. When wizards will rule the world. This is the Arnamancy podcast featuring Reverend Eric. Join me on an exploration of the practice, philosophy, and history of the occult, esotericism, and the paranormal. Today, on the podcast, we are joined by Dan Attrell, the massive mind behind the Modern Hermeticist YouTube channel, which includes the vast and ever-growing Encyclopedia Hermetica. He's gone out of his way to share tons of his knowledge and learning with his billions of adoring fans, and is also known for translating a lot of groovy stuff from Latin, including his latest work, a uh, translation of Marsilio Ficino's De Christiana Religione. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Marsilio Ficino. Uh, Dan, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, Marsilio Ficino was uh, kind of, uh, he was kind of the superstar of the Italian Renaissance. I don't know if he knew it at the time, but his his uh, translation work and the stuff that he did to like incorporate uh, so many different kind of like forgotten or marginalized ideas back into you know, European thinking uh, really kicked off like the whole slew of renaissances all across Europe. Would, do you think that's, yeah. that's an accurate way to look at him? I think that's correct in, in, in a lot of ways. I think Ficino was very self-conscious about being a propagandist essentially for the Medici court. And in his capacity as a translator of ancient works, of the works of Plato in particular, but also of a handful of other things like the Corpus Hermeticum, he was cultivating an image of a wise sage and, and the union of the secular and the sacred spheres in the form of one person. And of course, the grand aim of this was to try to get a Medici pope on the throne. And, and this would help to usher in uh, a new golden age <laughs> to get rid of this barbarous Iron Age where, you know, Turks are on the doorstep and everybody is studying Averroes in the universities and, and things just aren't quite as good as they were in the pristine time of the early Christian church uh, when, when Rome and the church were allied together in, right. in this perfect harmony. So he very much saw himself consciously as a, a, a person re, re-inaugurating this marriage. But whether he thought of it as a renaissance is another thing, but certainly he saw it in terms of cycles of, of light and darkness coming and going, and that the light was on its way back with his translations of Plato. I have a few questions about that. Like, So, so you think Ficino was consciously part of this like he was sort of like handpicked by the medici to take part in that in that role so he he took part in that role but he also was doing it on purpose like he knew that he knew he was a propagandist yeah well it depends Maybe, you know propaganda is a modern term and it usually has a connotation that is pejorative the sense is that you are disseminating information that is false I don't think that Ficino was consciously disseminating false information like some grand right. platonic noble lie or anything like that. I think Ficino was 100% a believer in the things that he wrote and talked about. Right. But and he was nonetheless, he was, he was cultivating this uh, image of a philosopher king in Lorenzo and Cosimo, well, Cosimo and then Lorenzo. And in a sense, like when you say cultivating an image, like Ficino... Uh, was a believer in the power of images themselves, and he was probably like literally creating this image in almost kind of a magical sense. Yeah, very much so. And I think, you know, everybody talks nowadays about Pierre Hadot and the the French philosopher who talks about how philosophy was this thing that was this lived thing. It's not necessarily... Uh, a set of ideas or doctrines, and although it is that as well, it has a component where the Stoics hang out in the Stoa and they do Stoic things and they dress like Stoics and then 
you know, the mall goths hang out at the mall and they do the mall goth thing. And so Ficino is very much cultivating this image of the, this platonic academy. And as he's sees himself as bringing Plato back to the light. Um, and Plato, of course, himself in his works is very much in support of these great ideological republics, these like grand planned states, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. It's funny, you know, we were talking, um, before we started recording about what, what just a, a compressed mess of history that sort of like late 15th century, early 16th century Italy ended up being, you know, with all the invasions and stuff. But even when it came to the, even when it came to the academic stuff, like neither uh, Ficino or Pico lived to see uh, what happened in Venice, like all the Venetian Renaissance stuff that was just like 10, 15 years later. You know? Right. And, and and that's why like the Renaissance is a really sticky term too, mm-hmm. because some people say it starts with Dante and Petrarch in, in the mid 14th century. And then here we are arguably in the height of the Renaissance, which is a century later or more. And then, and then still yet there is an, another hundred years of, of Renaissance, depending on, you know, there's a, the Northern Renaissance as they call it. And it's not like things just stop changing in Italy. So Renaissance is a, is a kind of a modern historiographical concept and I don't particularly subscribe to it. I more, I'm more of like a continuity emphasizer than a change emphasizer. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's not what sells books or creates scholarly societies or departments or issues diplomas, right? So we maintain these artificial divisions. Yeah, because Um, you have to think about like, did the Renaissance end when the Reformation started or... Yeah, but, some people like to frame their their narratives that way. Um, but like, that, I don't even think yeah. of like the Reformation as like a time period so much as a religious movement. And then the Renaissance is is not a time period either. It's more of a, a an art historical movement primarily, mm-hmm. or a textual movement. Yeah, or maybe uh, maybe both side by side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That does make things complicated and it and i think reframing uh ficino the way that you that you just did um as sort of like the the image maker uh you know that was sort of part of the movement to get a de medici pope is a good one was there ever a de medici pope oh yeah pope leo the 10th oh that's uh, right he was infamously uh, yeah uh, excommunicated martin luther Right. Um, he was a, a Medici Pope, but that was uh, some time later. Yeah, that was what the 1520s. Uh, yeah, earlier than that. Still, I think. Yeah. Um, and he, was he the one? Yeah, he was not an awesome Pope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Depends he, who you ask, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he definitely. I'm sure he was a fun Pope. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about uh, De Christiana Religione, the, the the thing that you just translated. Can you give us sort of a rundown of this? Like what time period of uh, Ficino's life did it come out of? The the De Christiana Religione was written in, in two phases. So it was written primarily in Latin because Ficino was working from a bunch of sources that are in Latin. So he is collating this stuff in about... Uh, 1473, and this is the year that he becomes a Roman Catholic priest. And this is 10 years about after he wrote the translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. And he had been spending the time in between that, translating the complete works of Plato and writing commentaries and living out uh, this kind of lavish life at Careggi, this villa out just outside of Florence. I suppose now it's in mm-hmm. Florence, but that's just because Florence has expanded. Right. Uh, so in taking up the priestly vows, he was in a position where he had to prove his good faith because he was well known as this translator of pagan works. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he wrote the De Christiana Religione as a kind of introduction or preface to the platonic theology on the immortality of the soul, which is 
uh, another massive 18 book anti Averroin treatise that he wrote um, in, in the preceding years, but he didn't release that until 1482. So he wanted to release the De Christiana Religione first. And what that text essentially is, is on the one hand, it's a kind of reinauguration of the marriage of Platonism and Christianity. Okay. And that, that makes up like the first half of the text. But then the second half of the text is, I'm not going to say it's copy pasted, but it's pretty closely copy pasted from uh, two Dominican anti-Jewish authors. These, these, both these men were formerly Jewish and they converted to Christianity and they became pro-Christian anti-Jewish polemicists. So those men are Paul of Burgos, uh, also known as Pablo of Santa Maria. And then the other guy is Jerome of Santa Fe. And so these two uh, Dominican authors wrote their anti-Jewish polemics sometime in the late 1300s, early 1400s. And these became very influential texts. Uh, in the Italian world and just in the, in the Spanish world in general. And they were essentially guides. They weren't the, the first of the kind, but they were certainly um, a large expansion on earlier medieval endeavors. And these were attempts to refute Jews using their own sources. So a lot of Ficino's main philosophical opponents at the time, the anti-Platonists, so to speak, were uh, not only the nominalists, but people who depended on readings of, say, Moses Maimonides or Averroes. And of course, Maimonides is commenting on Averroes. Hmm. But they had kind of brought in these ideas from the Arabic world that suggested that the soul upon death was essentially absorbed into this uh, over intellect and then the soul was essentially destroyed uh, because it was reunited with the one. So that flies in the face of the immortality of the soul, which is a platonic doctrine and also a Christian doctrine. So Ficino is thinking, how do we get rid of not only these Turks who are, you know, banging down the gates in the East and with their various beliefs, but also how do we deal with the beliefs at home, the presence of Jewish beliefs, the presence of Islamic beliefs. These are non-Christian, non-Platonic ideas. So he writes this book, the De Christiana Religione, in an attempt to battle or, or um, embolden Christianity against these intellectual foes that's sort of like pulling in the um argument against maimonides and Averroes is is really fascinating to me because uh i've <clears throat> i've been running into maimonides from the other direction from sort of like jewish uh sort of the interpretation that maimonides is actually reacting against sort of like early kabbalistic stuff and maimonides is yeah like brethren of purity which yeah and it's just kabbalistic but right yeah a lot, of the, and... a lot of the early Kabbalistic stuff um, had, and even later Kabbalistic stuff, had this uh, interpretation of the soul where uh, not everybody even got a whole soul. <laughs> um, mm. And that's sort of uh, fascinating. Like the, the unity with the, or the sort of the, the rejoining after death with the source is super core in a lot of those mystical teachings. And it's fascinating to hear that that's, that's not really platonic. So the Platonic view of the soul has an immortal soul that wh what happens to you after you die, according to Plato? Well, so here's where it gets messy, because we say Platonic, but what do we mean by that? Do we mean what Plato thought? Well, I would yeah, assume. Not <laughs> really. What we kind of mean is there's a Platonic tradition within Latin Western Christianity that gets passed on through a handful of authors like Augustine, like Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, and so forth, who was believed to be at the source of all these things. So Ficino uh, believed that Dionysius the Areopagite 
was in fact the, as in the Bible, was the uh, disciple of the Apostle Paul. And so that puts guys like Proclus downstream from Dionysius, as opposed to the other way around, where Dionysius is really reskinning Proclus. Ficino saw it the other way around, that the Platonists usurped or appropriated the teachings of the Christians and used it in a kind of stripped down, neutered way to shed light on the mysteries of their own teacher. But they, they, within Christendom, they believed that these teachings were truly Christian in origin. And in that Dionysian, Pauline, Platonic fusion, so to speak, you have a world where the soul is immortal so it doesn't perish among uh, uh, upon death. Uh, so, you know, it can wind up in hell or, or heaven. And then when it winds up in heaven, uh, there are various places where it can wind up. And you're in God's throne room, ultimately, rejoicing with all of the saints and, and all of the angels, all of the other disembodied celestial or not, sorry, super celestial intelligences, the angelic intelligences and there in the center of that divine throne room is the king of the spirits yahweh god and and in a sense when you die you go and you go join up with that but it, it you don't become one with the trinity you are in a sense a human humans are a separate world altogether they are depending on, you know, if you ask Pico or Ficino, they have different ideas. Uh, for Ficino, man is the perfect middle between the lowest kind of matter and the highest kind of thing, which of course is God or the angelic intellects. But somewhere in the middle between those two extremes is man. And that's why when God decides to express his infinite nature he spills forth as a man into the material world and that is the incarnate christ and that happens right in the middle of history so this gets okay. then tied into these debates about when the messiah comes and has the messiah come and this is how it ties into jewish polemics because these are well-worn polemical tropes i'm kind of fascinated by this um this idea that the the separation between God and man is so, is so important. Like the, like man is not allowed to, or, you know, in the, in the sort of Christian worldview, like it's, it's bad to, to view man as rejoining or the, the soul of man rejoining Godhood. And that makes me think of the creation story in book one of the Corpus Hermeticum, which uh, I'm sure uh, Ficino must have absolutely loved because in that man is sort of a separate divinity from the creator God. Yes. And this is where this like there are competing ideas of what is more dignified. Is it do you have more dignity if you become eradicated and become one with God in this mm. kind of more monistic sense? Or is it more dignified if God made man in his own image? Therefore, he made a kind of other God that lives with him. And of course, he is the father God. But we are lesser gods that dwell in his realm. And so that is, that's the question. What is more dignified to become absorbed or perfected or um, to live in, in, in peace with the super celestial intelligences? Like what is the highest goal of mankind? And I think this is really one of the major debated issues in renaissance philosophy is is like what is the end of man is, is it science is it knowledge that's something that is that the picatrix claims that it's kind of its own good because it makes you at one with the intellect mm -hmm. or is there some sort of higher post-intellectual or super intellectual good that is achievable that we ought to be striving for and what is that? And these are debates that were present in Maimonides' time, in the time of 
Petrus Alfonsi, even probably in the time of Al Cortubi when he was writing the Picatrix, but they really come to a head in the Renaissance in all of their multiplicity and, and their um, dynamic, uh, you know, there, there are many aspects which are, are reflecting into each other in the Renaissance in a way that they weren't really previously. Things were a bit more isolated, but now you've got a full range of connections being made that weren't being made before. And those debates, I think they were swept away with, with the enlightenment. But if we wanted to go back to a pre enlightenment conception of the world, we would wind up somewhere around those lines again, maybe with a, yeah. you know, clearer texts, a better, um, better vision of what the ancients believed, maybe. But in general, we would have to start where they were before uh, we stripped spirit out of everything. Which is crazy because th those are kind of unknowable answers. Like we, uh, as uh, embodied souls, we don't necessarily get to know with any certainty or with any provability what the... Uh, super celestial world would even be but that's the the postmodern position that is it certainly is. not the renaissance position which is that reason is this gift it's like a golden ladder that god just drops down from heaven and if you only grab onto that ladder you can be drawn up by the power of your reason to find out what those things are the thing is that like even within that frame of discourse there are different different re reckonings of what is reasonable and so that then that that gets us into philosophy and the great debates of philosophy um i have a question about uh sort of like what the catholic church or what sort of like christian philosophy was looking at was looking like um just before ficino came on the scene um because I guess sort of the oversimplistic view is that uh, is that the big Christian philosophers before Ficino were uh, kind of basing everything on Aristotle, but yes, I, it couldn't have been that simple. Like, what were they looking at? No, like, it's definitely not that simple. But that is kind of how people frame it, and, and even, then they frame it as yeah. like Plato comes in and saves the day. But then Aristotle is around for another 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say Aristotle's still around, isn't he? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that also it's hard to separate Aristotle from Plato sometimes. Like he was Plato's student and you kind of get the impression from some of his writings that it's kind of platonic stuff that's coming out of him anyhow. Yeah, that's another debate that was big in the Renaissance is like to what extent were Plato and Aristotle at odds or to what extent were they, was Aristotle actually a student of Plato and he was recapitulating the system? And so Ficino, I think himself went through a lot of uh, soul searching in regards to this very question, because when he was younger, he went through this Lucretian atomist materialist phase. And he, he was really into the um, De Rerum Natura poem, but then that that poem is materialist it denies the immortality of the soul the eternal wisdom of god determined that only those who are true lovers of true wisdom are to perform the divine mysteries at least at the very beginnings of religion therefore it happened that among primitive men, the same men investigated the causes of things and diligently conducted sacrifices to the very highest cause of things, and were themselves also philosophers and priests among all the nations. And this by no means was wrong. For since the soul, as our Plato would agree, can only fly back to the heavenly father and fatherland on two wings, namely the intellect and the will. The philosopher relies most on the intellect, while the priest relies on the will. The intellect 
illuminates the will, and the will sets the intellect alight. It is commonly agreed that they, who, through intelligence, first discovered the divine, whether by finding it by themselves or by arriving at it through divine inspiration, through will first worshipped the divine correctly and spread correct worship of it and the method of their worship to others. Therefore, the prophets of the Hebrews and Essenes were inclined to wisdom and priesthood simultaneously. The philosophers among the Persians, because they were in charge of sacred rites, were called magi, that is, priests. The Indians consulted the Brahmins on both the nature of things and the purification of souls. Among the Egyptians, mathematicians and metaphysicians took up the priesthood and the kingship. Among the Ethiopians, the gymnosophists were at once teachers of philosophy and prelates of religion. The same tradition prevailed in Greece under Linus, Orpheus, Musaeus, Eumolpus, Melampus, Trophimus, Agliophemus, and Pythagoras. The same applies in Gaul under the governance of the Druids. Who can ignore how much zeal for wisdom the sacred rites, Numa Pompilus, Valerius Soranus, Marcus Varro, and many others among the Romans had? Finally, who does not know how much and how true a doctrine there was among the primitive Christian bishops and priests? What blessed ages which have guarded this entire divine marriage of wisdom and religion, especially among the Hebrews and the Christians? What utterly woeful times when the wretched divorce of Pallas and Themis happened? What an abomination! Thus the sacred was given to dogs to mangle, the doctrine was in large part handed down to profane men, and so, since it mostly became an instrument of iniquity and wantonness, it is more appropriate to call it cunning than knowledge. The pearls of most precious religion, however, are often handled by the ignorant and trod upon as if by swine. Often, it seems that the inept administration at the hands of the ignorant and cowardly must be called superstition rather than religion. In this way, they do not faithfully understand the truth, which, being divine, shines alone on the eyes of the pious. However much they may try, those men either worship God incorrectly or misconduct the sacred rites since they are entirely ignorant of matters human and divine. How long shall we endure this harsh and wretched lot of an Iron Age, gentlemen, citizens of the heavenly fatherland and inhabitants of the earth? Please, any time now, let us, if we can, deliver philosophy, the sacred gift of God, from impiety. What is more, we can, if we but will. Let us redeem the holy faith with all our strength from execrable ignorance. Therefore, I urge everyone and beseech the philosophers for their part to take religion to their heart or arrive at it, but I beseech the priests to incline themselves diligently toward the pursuit of lawful wisdom. I myself do not know how much I have accomplished or will accomplish in this matter. Still, I have tried, and I shall not cease from trying not by my own little genius, but relying on the clemency and powers of God. Benevolent Lorenzo, your grandfather, the great Cosimo, then your pious father Piero, sustained me with their wealth from a tender age when I could first practice philosophy. Recently, as is your custom in a good many other matters, by your own will you have enjoined in me, to the best of your ability, the zeal for philosophizing with the duty of piety. You have with distinction honored your Marsilio Ficino with a priesthood. Would that I never, or will never, let myself down, since the favor and aid of God himself and of the Medici has never let me down. When I was initiated into the sacred rites of the priesthood, I composed the work 
upon the Christian religion to better procure divine grace for myself and gratify you, and to not let myself down. I saw fit to dedicate this treatise to you, the supporter of my profession, not only as the chief guardian of wisdom, but also as the chief cultivator of piety. Dan, it's, it's been Welcome. a day. <laughs> We've both had 24 hours to to sit and think about uh, Aristotle and Plato. Um, I don't know how much time you spent on the, on this particular subject, but uh, it uh, I didn't allow it to like keep me up or anything. I was just sort of like, yeah, Aristotle, Plato. Um, and so you were you were mentioning about how, um, or we were talking about how in the Renaissance it wasn't necessarily super clear that. Aristotle, Aristotle and Plato uh, disagreed on stuff, or were sort of viewed as opposites. And I know that's, I don't know how common that is amongst philosophers nowadays, but in terms of popular philosophy or how popular philosophy ever gets, uh, Aristotle and Plato are kind of looked at as two different schools. And um, and in particular, I remember learning um, kind of this thing where before the uh, Italian Renaissance, before Ficino and before, you know, Minutius and all those guys started publishing uh, the Platonic stuff, like more Plato and more Neoplatonists and stuff like that. Uh, the church was sort of considered to be based on Aristotle's philosophy and that that shift over to Plato's philosophy was new and different and in some ways viewed as opposite. And, uh, but but it wouldn't have been that way in Ficino's time. Uh, during the Middle Ages, you don't really have Aristotle in his original form. You have copies of Aristotle, translations of Aristotle, and most of all, commentaries of Aristotle. And these are like, for example, the commentaries of, of Aroes, who was known in Europe as the commentator, whereas as Aristotle was the philosopher, of Aroes was the commentator and people encountered Aristotle through the lens of these thinkers. And that wasn't, you know, necessarily a bad thing, but when the Greek texts start floating around in the Latin West, uh, texts of Aristotle in the original Greek and people start to compare, it's the same issues arise as when people started comparing the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible with the Greek manuscripts. They started to uh, find discrepancies. And then, based on those discrepancies, those had whole chains of, of consequences affecting theological matters or scientific matters or what have you. So, we didn't have Aristotle in his pure form. That was something that came with the humanists uh but the greeks did of course uh, the byzantine uh greeks always sort of had aristotle in greek so it's it's not like aristotle had disappeared or anything like that uh it's just that contact between the east and the west was not so great in terms of uh communicating these particular philosophical ideas did um did that get reflected in uh, the theology of like the the Eastern churches and the Latin Church much or um, yes but I I'm not really the best person to talk on that subject because the differences on some things are so great and then the differences on other things are so subtle True. and um and, and people feel really strongly about this stuff so I try not to talk about it too much. Um, to, I'm more kind of concerned uh, uh, about how Platonism, I guess, affects theology in in the Quattrocento. Okay, well then let's go back to that. Uh, let's swing back to Ficino and the stuff he was working on. Um, and also, what's Quattrocento? Oh, the 1400s. Oh. Just a fancy, <laughs> fancy <laughs> Renaissance way of saying. The, the 14, 1400s. Well, I'm going to start saying that now. Quattrocento. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. So we go we go back there where basically uh, there was very little Plato available. Like the Timaeus had been around or something like that, but mostly it was just uh, 
uh, Latin translations of Aristotle. So um, when Ficino started working on all of this stuff, uh, and I'm I'm totally gonna I know we're gonna rehash some stuff that we talked about yesterday, but what was what was his main interest in um, refuting like uh, Averroes? Was it uh, was it because of his uh, you know desire to like convert Jews to Christianity or you know what was going on with that? Like, did you get a sense so, of that? Well, these are kind of two different issues, but that sort of um, they converge at a certain point in that. Maimonides was a commentator on Averroes, and Maimonides was uh, a great, I suppose you could say, opponent. Well, he wasn't directly an opponent of Christendom, but he was he was a rationalist. And as a rationalist, usually you tend to stand in opposition in some ways to the more quote unquote spiritual readings of Scripture, uh, which in Christendom are, of course, Christological readings. So Maimonides is always trying to get you to think about things rationally, whereas someone like Vicino is always trying to get you to say like, oh, look how this prefigures the Trinity, or look how this is a clue about the Christological nature of being in time or the Trinitarian structure of, of creation, these kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that is one of the ways that that plays out. That's interesting. That does remind me of one of the things we discussed yesterday, which was um, from from a modern point of view, a lot of the stuff that Ficino was so fascinated by uh, seems unknowable to us. But that just has to do with the, you know, kind of like worldview or philosophical worldview that is part of our culture. But it's also kind of sounding like maybe Maimonides, with his rationalist point of view, might have been a little more down to earth. I'm wondering if. I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, uh, how do I put this into words? I guess what I'm wondering is, did the commentator, the, so Maimonides being the commentator on Averroes and Averroes being the commentator of Aristotle, uh, it, did their commentaries um, influence the West's view of Aristotle so much that it's still sort of, that influence is still felt today? Yes, yeah, certainly in the in the history of philosophy, I would say so. But m I think that once people started recovering the Greek Aristotle, a lot of people, um, and this is a strong current in the historiography, is that people started sweeping away the Arabs and the um, the what they thought of as intermediary thinkers, which is not fair because it's not like the Arabic philosophers were just copying and pasting and not changing or contributing anything. Um, but that was very much the attitude in the Renaissance was that all of these later thinkers were corrupting the purity of the original text, which was closer to uh, essentially a golden age of philosophy. And that the later people who they were interpreting these texts they were uh, factionalists. They they broke up into little groups instead of being united in one great love of wisdom. And um, that is very much what Ficino is trying to do. And in that uh, recording I sent you, mm -hmm. we can hear Ficino talk sort of firsthand about how he feels about this reuniting of philosophy and theology together where they have been rent apart from a Christian perspective. Yeah. One thing that struck me about that was the, uh, near the, near the beginning of the recording, which everybody has heard by now. I'm it's, it's going to be stuck in between our two, uh, segments here. Um, Ficino talks about the philosophers being driven by the intellect and priests being driven by their will or something of that nature where, Mm -hmm. There, there is sort of a rend in how um, how things are understood or interpreted or even, I guess, used. Yeah, it's like which group demonstrates which quality of feet, the chariot and the phaedrus. So there's one one horse is the intellect and the other is the will, and the priest 
works through the will, whereas the philosopher works through the intellect. But what Ficino wants is instead of having a priest on one hand doing one thing and a, and a philosopher doing another, he wants these to be united into one person, just like in the times of old when the philosophers were priests and the priests were philosophers. And so that's very much like a, there's a nostalgia for, for an era that, that never was, or perhaps was um, in Ficino's mind, but he imagined it to be far more, I think, Christian than, than it truly had been. But he also, uh, he also kind of embodied them that himself, right? Because the same year that he published uh, De, uh, Christiana Religione, he got ordained. That's correct. Or the year right before it. Yeah. Yes. So, so he basically was like this, it, it was almost, um, even like an apologia of what he himself was doing and what he had been trying or what he was sort of creating in his own example. Yeah, very much so. He's trying to demonstrate his good faith. And he even says that in the, in the introduction that this is to show my good faith and, and for the glory of my patron. So that book was published in the 1470s. Is that what you said? I that's yeah. So it has a kind of complicated publication history, which we don't need to get in too much because it's a bit dry. But uh, to keep things brief, he writes it in uh, Latin and then publishes it first in Italian in 1474, and then in 1476 he publishes it in Latin. And this he publishes, as I mentioned uh, earlier, before the Platonic Theology, which is his great 18 work Summa. Um, but this work acts as a kind of preface and where the Theologia Platonica argues against Averroes and let's say the materialists, people like Lucretius and Democritus and so forth, uh, this text argues against Jewish biblical interpretation because what's a bigger threat to a Christian's interpretation of the Old Testament than a Jew's interpretation of the Old Testament. So he essentially writes this and uses the works of former Jews to, to counter those attacks. So he's really like covering all of his bases in his mind. Um, he's trying to lay out a full plan of regener of platonic regeneration so that, you know, if you no longer want to be involved with these university pursuits, these scholarly pursuits, you can come and join this new way of thinking, which is the, the platonic way of thinking. It's sort of like endeavors today to get outside of the university. You know, there's a lot of people who, they get fed up and tired of academia. They go outside of academia. They start their own, I don't know, publishing house or magazine or something. Or podcast. Yeah, podcast, <laughs> uh, independent university, what have you. It all ends up being basically a podcast. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what Ficino was doing, but in book form. And he would have salons of his friends who were humanists, also under the patronage of Lorenzo and uh, they would get together and they would declamate and have orations and, and um, give speeches and, and, you know, think about the good old days. <laughs> so that's, that's something that they did. And, and nowadays, I don't know, sometime during the 20th century, this myth of the platonic Academy arose whereby people had these ideas that, Ficino was actually heading like a formal school, sort of like Proclus was heading. And that is not true. Like the Platonic Academy, if it is anything at all, it is this salon of, of friends, of, of in, informal gathering of intellectuals. They walk through the garden, they play some lute uh, or lyre or whatnot, um, that sort of thing. So there wasn't a formalized Platonic Academy going on then. No, definitely not. Oh, that's kind of a bummer. 
you, that <laughs> I liked that. Myth. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it bumps people out too. Cause there's so many people who nowadays they want to revive the platonic Academy or they, they look to this era as an era of revival. And it's like, how do we today break out of the university system? Oh, look to Ficino and his model of the platonic Academy. And it's like, well, first off, that only works if you have a really wealthy patron buying you a villa mm -hmm. and, you know, you have the luxury to sit around with your friends and and contemplate esoteric minutia about Platonism. But that's that's not realistic necessarily for most people. And it was not a, a formalized attempt. It was more just Lorenzo was throwing money at Ficino in order to cultivate part of this image. And uh, that involved people getting together and uh, having cultured conversations. Something uh, similar happened in Venice after Ficino died too. It, it, there, was a, there was a Venetian academy of some sort that, uh, that was also founded, wasn't there? That may be true, but uh, I'm not uh, exactly privy to the details on that. Me neither. I will have to look into that a little bit and see what see what that was all about. Um, this was all, like humanist circles were all over the place at, the, at this time mm -hmm. um, and had been going strong for for about a century now. Um, the oh, problem really? with humanism, people always think about it as being very late, but you can argue that there are so-called humanists going back to uh, lawyers in Pavia in the 12th century or just people looking through old manuscripts, old texts, looking for new ideas uh, or ways to fix problems that are in the texts today mm -hmm. with texts from yesterday. So that kind of activity had been going around for some time. Yeah, that makes sense. How much did Ficino's translation of the Corpus Hermeticum uh, influence some of his later writings on Plato and uh, material like a, a De Christiana Religione? I think it, it it is influential, but in a kind of subtle way or an indirect way. He definitely takes from the Hermetic worldview the idea that man is a kind of nexus between the material and the divine, like that's not really something that is too prominent in Christianity or in Platonism necessarily, but is quite prominent in the Asclepius and in the Corpus Hermeticum. Okay. Um, and this idea of like the centrality of man in the cosmos, I don't know to what extent that is, platonic as well it seems rather um hermetic to me uh, whatever hermetic means right the, right that's a whole <laughs> other can of worms and but we also have that can of worms problem with with some aspects of of plato don't we i mean uh totally you know uh on schwepp you know earl fontanelle talks about talked about this when he went through his plato stuff where we have a lot of uh, Plato's dialogues, but it also it always seems like there's a missing component, like perhaps some sort of oral teaching or oral history that that never got recorded. And maybe, you know, later generations might have had access to the same stuff, but it's really difficult to tell for certain what the yeah. actual guts of Plato were about. Yeah, like you don't find a system in the dialogues. Uh, the system, the systematization of Plato comes much later. It arises in Proclus. And it's then from Proclus that you get uh, that influences Dionysius. And then Dionysius gets copied or translated by Eugenia. And from there, that gets transferred into the Latin West and it becomes a very influential text. Albertus Magnus comments on it, Thomas Aquinas very familiar with it. And so Proclus, through the translations of uh, William of Morbeck, who again, that that translation is is mediated through the Arabic. So you get Proclus and you get Dionysius. And so you get this Platonic tradition in the Latin West based on those authors uh, and those texts. So by the time you get a recovery of actual Platonic dialogues, you already have in motion uh, 
these older homegrown platonic currents. And so whether or not you have the dialogues of Plato, you have these more fully fledged, fully articulated systems from late antiquity that have stuck around. And those definitely color the re-reception of, of Plato. And in a way, like the uh, 18 book Platonic theology that Ficino writes is an attempt to give an alternative elements of theology uh, to the to the pagan Proclean system. He felt that Thomas Aquinas had interacted with that William of Morbeck translated text of Proclus's, and he felt that there could be a a, a more Platonizing synthesis than an Aristotelianizing synthesis. Uh, that that's very much why he wrote that text as a kind of alternative. So, yeah, Plato was around in the Latin West, just not in the dialogues. And when it comes to the system, what is it? Well, that's a can of worms. And then we also get into the problem of Platonic Orientalism, right? Where right. it's like everything is mystical and Eastern and Oriental. But then when you really start peeling back the layers of what they're referring to it's usually these like platonist ideas that have ironed over eastern mysticism some point in late antiquity and before coming to the latin west right because you get that um uh okay let just to clear things up for the listeners and for me uh proclus was uh sort of around the same time or later than like uh, plotinus and porphyry and the kind of like weirdo yeah he comes later okay um but uh uh porphyry and plotinus and iamblichus weren't available um in latin translations until uh around the time of ficino or even a little later. ficino ficino right he did did he do all three of them yes okay well that must have been weird yeah I, i mean i think like i don't know if they were around before but as like uh, the thing about Porphyry is everybody knew who Porphyry was because Celsus. You have this right. great polemical pagan work by Celsus, which also only survives in uh, commentaries by church fathers. But that contained a lot of arguments uh, and quotes of Porphyry's text. Okay, that's interesting. So people knew about Porphyry. Uh, they knew, and like through Augustine, they also knew about the the Platonists. And of course, Augustine says that the Platonists play a major role in his conversion experience away from Manichaeanism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is a tradition in place, but they are very much, um, the Platonists are seen as kind of these like half-baked Christians or like imperfect Christians. Because, <laughs> yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay, I want to, um, let's say uh, somebody li- is listening to us right now, and they're sort of like, I have to go read uh, De Christiana Religione. I want to go read Dan's translation. Is there some background material that you would advise them to read first? Like, what what does somebody need to uh, be familiar with before they approach your translation and are able to get a lot out of it? It would help to read the Phaedrus. Um, you would definitely want to know your Bible. Uh, there's a good deal of biblical citations and and um, a lot of references to the Old Testament, the books of the prophets, that sort of thing gets debated in the latter half of the work. But I would say, it, the thing is, I would recommend this to anybody anyways. Anybody who's into esotericism or the occult or anything like that, if you haven't read cover to cover the dialogues of Plato and the Bible. I don't know what you're waiting for. Those are really like maybe along with Homer in Virgil, you need to read that stuff. That's really fundamental. And I think that would carry you a long way. The rest is all downhill. It's footnotes to Plato, right? Oh yeah. (laughs) So, so I think if you read the Plato's dialogues uh, and you read the Bible, you would be pretty much well equipped to understand what's going on. Um, but it's hard to say because there are so many other layers. There's a lot of Eusebius, there's a lot of church fathers being used, and then there's a lot of converse literature. But 
I don't think you necessarily need to be very well versed in that stuff just to read about it. Um, maybe to translate, you've got to do quite a bit of research to get it right. But just reading, uh, I think you'd be fine with the works of Plato and reading your Old and New Testament. Was this your first attempt at translating anything by Ficino? Uh, yes, it was. What uh, did, did you come across any surprises? Like, did you get in there and be like, oh, crap, I've got to go back and read this other thing first? Or There were lots of weird surprises. Like, I don't want to shit on Ficino, but like the, it, <laughs> I was kind of disillusioned in certain ways by this guy who I thought was this genius, basically. And when you encounter his texts and you see his mistakes and you see kind of the leaps in logic that he makes and you see you, you know you you get to know these these authors really closely and you see them as a lot more human one of the things Ficino does a lot is wear the style of the people he's copying um and he does cite his sources but it's sort of like he cites it once in the middle of a massive chapter and if you don't catch that reference, you're not really going to know that most of this material has been excised from other people's works and with with very little modification, like some modification. I wouldn't accuse him of plagiarism because plagiarism is kind of a post-capitalistic concept, mm -hmm. like intellectual property and all that kind of stuff. I think people wrote books for very different reasons than to try to make money or what have you. Um, he was trying to assemble all, all of his thoughts in one place about this this platonic revival of Christianity uh, that emphasizes the immortality of the soul. And I think, yeah, you for that you you would be good to read the dialogues of Plato, read read the Bible. But if you want to go deep, the Schwepp podcast is a great place to start. Oh, um, I feel like um, the dialogues of Plato are great to read, but uh, it's very difficult to um, to understand this their significance without something like the Schwepp podcast to be like, oh no, look, you know, read this actually literally and see how weird it is. Yeah, um, I think I was spoiled. Uh, well, you could, my you, teacher you... of Plato and or just classics in general was a scholar of Neoplatonism. Like he wrote his PhD dissertation on Proclus, and so I think just going through that material with him was kind of a this initiation in a way um, where I don't know exactly who his uh, teacher was he went to cornell university uh in the 70s but so i i'm not sure who who his professor was but presumably he got a whole lot of wisdom from that teacher and then passed that on to me uh and that's that's really the only way that i can understand plato in any capacity and i'm not saying that i understand plato through and through he's one of the most mysterious authors oh, and God. can be re read so <laughs> yeah, polyvalently in so many dimensions in so many ways. And, and when you're reading him in the Greek too, then you're focusing on a whole other set of issues like puns and wordplay and that sort of stuff, uh, which you, which just doesn't get conveyed in the English. Right. So I think there is a kind of hermetic tradition to understanding Plato, but, that that in and of itself is a later development it is a tradition but yeah it depends who you talk to um if you talk to diehard platonists they will say that that was at the heart of plato's works the whole time and he inherited it from somebody and he got it from i don't know pythagoras or zoroaster or whatnot and that is the prisca theologia narrative uh how much is that true well the verdict is still out but uh it's definitely an, an issue that is still hotly contested it's just contested in a different way today than it was in the renaissance we have different rules <laughs> yeah do you have a favorite uh, english translation of plato that you turn to i don't um i just kind of dealt with so many different translations because i don't uh, like i i the only time I ever read through the entire collection 
by one translator, it was the audiobook because I wanted to hear with the, um, you know, it's sometimes it's a lot clearer when you have these actors reading out since it's a dialogue and you have the parts. So it sounds more like a play. Oh, and yeah. I find that's more conducive to understanding. And like silent reading is not really like that's a modern thing anyways. So I like the the audio versions of it, um, but I don't know exactly uh, who produced it or who the translator was. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to individual dialogues, I often deal with them one at a time by different translators and and then at other times looking at the Greek itself. In which case, I'm usually just using something like Perseus Project or whatever. Right. Yeah, I guess I've been I've been thinking about that a lot because I want to go back and revisit some of the um, some of Plato, and uh, I have like tons of little, you know, the sort of like pamphlet sized individual dialogues scattered around, and I just want I just want one big book. <laughs> yeah, you can get them, and like yeah. it is, there is definitely a merit to reading them in order because there is a trajectory of thought in Plato's life. Mm -hmm. There is no platonic form of Plato that is unchanging throughout the course of his life. <laughs> uh, I, oh uh, man, that, that makes me think of all sorts of stuff that I want to talk about that, that just diverges further from what we're supposed to be talking about, which is Ficino. So we should probably, we but should. But does it, but does it, that's the question. I don't know. I, <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, I mean, one of my favorite things about Plato is like he so often is just using, he's putting the words into other people's mouths so much. And um, I was just tickled when I read uh, Xenophon and Socrates shows up in there and he's just some sort of like lowly soldier. I'm like, wait, the Socrates? And it's supposed to be the Socrates just hanging out in the army. Probably like a baby Socrates and not a not a grown up old man Socrates. Yeah, uh, they're all citizens. They're I know. <laughs> all doing the work and putting in their time so they mm -hmm. can hang out in the market later and talk harass about, people. Yeah, drink wine and harass and uh, corrupt the youth. <laughs> um so one thing that I think is really interesting about, you know, so we we did mention this yesterday too, the uh, the sort of like scrunched up timeline of the uh the Italian Renaissance and and how like fast everything sort of happened. I know we don't like the term Renaissance, but like Ficino and all of his contemporaries, uh, there was just so much happening during that period of time. And, and such a huge cultural shift was sort of going on then near the end of Ficino's life after Pietro, when Savonarola came to power, like, like Florence had kind of fallen into a sort of decadence or a kind of decadent culture had really started to take hold where you had kind of that like uh, Florentine neo-paganism coming in and all of the artists painting like, you know, the nude people and the gods and all that kind of stuff. Was Ficino buddies with Savonarola? So when Savonarola first arrives on the scene, which is in 1490, he comes from Ferrara and he's invited by Pico or rather he's invited by uh, Lorenzo de' Medici at the behest of Pico. And Pico and Savonarola were good university buddies. So that is how Savonarola comes to the scene. And um, Ficino was all right with him at first uh, because he was uh, the lector of philosophy at San Marco, the, um, the monastery of San Marco. And he was just a fellow theologian, a fellow philosopher. But very quickly, uh, Savonarola started his studies of the book of Revelation, and he started to give these sermons about Revelation, and he basically brought about this apocalyptic imminence, uh, this fear that things were just looming immediately at hand, and that a diluvium was coming, a flood. And this was a theme that actually had existed in Ficino and his friends. They were in their orations and in their um, in their diatribes to one another were often trying to beseech these Italian princes to band together and go and wage war against the Turk who had Sully been claiming 
Christian settlements, you know, year by year, decade by decade, they're getting closer and closer. So Savonarola is within this context and he's saying there is this flood or cataclysm coming and we need an ark to survive the flood. The ark is scripture. It is the Bible. It is like living like a true Christian. But th what that means is, of course, living like a Dominican friar. It's not just like living in, like any lay Christian life. This was Savonarola really wanted people to be hardcore. And he he demanded that from other people. And then he demanded that from people who he wasn't going to get that from. Right. Um, and so was there like a crazy pagan scene and all this stuff? Like surely in art. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but in terms of a renaissance of paganism itself, I don't particularly see that, but I do see this kind of anxiety in uh, a friar like Savonarola, he's got these apocalyptic tendencies that he's inherited from the Middle Ages, from all of these uh, monks. And uh, if you recall, our last conversation together we had with Joaquin of Fior. I was just Fior, thinking about him. <laughs> and that links, this all links together, right? So Savonarola actually in his, when he begins his round of of sermons about the book of revelations he has to warn his audience that he is getting this stuff just from scripture he is not getting it from joachim who he mentions specifically or other similar type of thinkers but the thing is he kind of is like he, you can't escape the changes that Joachim of Fior makes to Christian millenarianism. Whereas like in Augustine's day and age, people were already living in the end times in, mm -hmm. in the end of days. Whereas in Joachim, there's kind of a, still a future in the future. Uh, so Savonarola sees a future in the future and he wants people to be good Christians and he wants people to get rid of idolatry and he wants people to get rid of uh, adultery and any of the, you know, any sin whatsoever needs to go because anybody who doesn't turn over a new leaf is going to get wiped out when the flood comes, the proverbial flood. So it's sort of a, a type of evangelism, uh, maybe not like modern evangelism, totally. but yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I imagine uh, Ficino was super comfy with just like hanging out in his salon in his um, exactly. priest pajamas. The word is comfy. Yeah, that's the key word because Savonarola is a mendicant friar. He is about not being comfy, comfy. He's about kicking his shoes off and going and hanging out with the lepers and the prostitutes and the poor. And he probably and sleeps on a stone bench and has, exactly. has gruel you can go, twice a day. <laughs> you can go visit San Marco and see the cells that they slept in. Like very simple. Uh -huh. uh, and so you compare that to the lavish beds and chambers of the Borgia popes or of, of uh, his daughter, Lucretia. Uh, so it, it's like the life that Savonarola exemplified was the life of the medieval friar and, and very much Im imitating the Vita Apostolica, uh, living a life of apostolic poverty. All of these things were good. And Ficino was a moderate he was comfy he was fairly wealthy um and so he supported savonarola at first in in spirit but then very quickly uh savonarola started preaching against people who were synthesizing philosophy and theology oh so Sav so savonarola himself was a lector in philosophy but Having studied philosophy, he came to this kind of very skeptical conclusion that there are things that reason can tell you, and then there are things that go above and beyond reason that only faith can reveal to you. And so, so the entire endeavor of philosophy is compromised because it can only take you so far and it can't get you to take that leap of faith that's required for salvation. So why even bother with all of this stuff? The only use it has is to refute their teachings. So it's like the only reason you would learn philosophy is to debate with philosophers to tell them why they're wrong. And 
Facino, that did not sit well with him. That is not his vision of a reformed Christianity. It was not this radical sola scriptura approach. It was uh, this synthetic um, traditional approach that includes, you know, all of the church fathers and well, not that Savonarola denied the church fathers that would come later in the Renaissance or in the Reformation, but all of the philosophers and all of the pagan philosophers like your Hermes Trismegistuses and your Zoroasters and your Pythagoras's, these all had a special place in Ficino's heart. And for Savonarola, this was all vain and idolatrous and misleading. And you see Pico, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, taking uh, a more Savonarolan direction in the last four years of his life than you do seeing him take a Ficinian direction. And now, I don't say that necessarily to overemphasize the influence of Savonarola, uh, because people have done that in the past. It's actually that Savonarola and Pico were good friends and they had mutual influences on each other. So I think they both kind of radicalized one another in a way that kind of did like purity spiraling and, and <laughs> bootstrapped one another into higher states of, of purity. But what was really important was the, was the word. So that's why Pico gets into Kabbalah, gets into Hebrew and reading the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, reading Greek texts in Greek. Anybody who comes later and messes with the Greek and the Hebrew, they they did so out of error or out of some sort of barbarousness. And the only way we can get back to the unity of the early church is by getting back to this sense of um, one text that is uh, the same for everybody. God. And so that that's something that all of the humanist theologians had in common. They just expressed it in different ways. I can imagine the frustration of Ficino, where he, you know, because like uh, Savonarolo is about the same age as Pico. And they were both like, what, 20, 30 years younger than him? Uh, yeah. And he must have just been so frustrated just being like, hold on a second. We had a really good thing going here. All of a sudden, yeah. you guys, I'm in with like your Pico and fire Ficino and had started fighting before based around um, some interpretations of Plato's symposium. So uh, Ficino and, and, and Pico disagreed on how to publicly disagreed in writing on how, how to interpret Plato's symposium. But yeah, um, when it came to Savonarola and Ficino, Ficino in the year just before Ficino, uh, before Savonarola was executed, uh, he wrote to the College of Cardinals, that is Ficino, and uh, decried Savonarola as the Antichrist. So it's he gets sort of hoisted by his own petard. You you get people who are trying to rile other people up using these apocalyptic expectations and these apocalyptic themes. Well, then here comes Ficino who, you know, he's an elderly priest. I think he's like 64 years old at this point, 65. And he's writing to all of these Cardinals saying, look, this guy is the antichrist. And now antichrist of course, doesn't mean in, it doesn't mean, opposed to Christ, it means instead of Christ. So it's sort of like this holy man or this holy figure that people get swept up in some sort of demagogical fervor to follow. And he becomes this new Christ who replaces the original one. And that is what Ficino is, is arguing Savonarola sees himself as, as this kind of prophet. Um, he sees himself as his new Christ figure. So he's an antichrist. Huh. And uh, so presumably from that point of view, people would have seen some, some uh, merit to that statement. But I think that by Savonarola by that point had already dug his own grave. He had already insulted uh, Pope Alexander the sixth and he had already done all sorts of uh, uh, indiscretions that would get the people of Florence really upset with him. And so 
when they uh, when they killed him and lit his body on fire, there was really no pity for him because a lot of people felt that that's what he would have done to me. So <laughs> then, then there were people who thought he was a martyr. And that's why they burned his body because they didn't want people to come and grab his body parts and squirrel them away and use them as relics because nothing is worse than when a heretic gets a cult. Um, yeah. You know, that happens a lot throughout the history of the church and there are often problems. I guess you could um, probably even say that's kind of how the church got started. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, or, you know, the Protestant reformation is very much a, one of these stories where Luther just keeps getting away and keeps getting just the right amount of protection by just the right people just for just enough time to translate the Bible or, <laughs> or do whatever it is he's going to do in terms of political dealings. So, yeah, I think that they really wanted to keep this heresy uh, under wraps. Well, the real heresy that Savonarola committed was just not submitting to the Pope. Right. So, but when the Pope is just a political opportunist, uh, it's it's hard to say whether he was truly a heretic or not. Um, yeah, I mean, and then Pico was definitely a heretic, right? Right. And he got absolved by this very same Pope, Pope Alexander the Sixth, because presumably he didn't care as much about you know oh, who cares this guy thinks astrology and kabbalah helps justify christianity whatever yeah, like, <laughs> is go. that really gonna hurt anybody <laughs> exactly so it's like that there was a commission that that got him banned uh under a previous pope but uh yeah the borgia pope was not so concerned he lifted uh that ban before pico died but uh yeah savonarola had dug his own grave there was also the story of the trial by fire um where he was challenged by a franciscan monk to do a trial by fire and uh i think it got rained out and so it was seen as like an ill omen and uh that caused a riot where people went and charged the san marco monastery and they seized savonarola and that basically threw him in prison and mm. that was the beginning of the end well as long as Ficino managed to outlive Savonarola, I'm sure uh, that's that's that was a good thing for history. Yeah, two years. Two years. Yeah, yeah. This has been a really fascinating conversation. It's it, one of the things that I love about Ficino, and that is so, uh, I guess, both exciting and frustrating about him is it's it's impossible to talk about Ficino without exploring just the the breadth and depth of. Uh, the influences on him and the and the wide swath of stuff that he affected afterwards. So yeah, it's been really fun to kind of like dive into some of the um, some of the roots of his stuff. Th thank you for sharing all this stuff. I'm 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 always extremely grateful for all of the knowledge that you share with people. Uh, so I'm glad that you enjoy you know being cloistered in a university or doing whatever you're doing up there. <laughs> yep. I'm happy, happy to share and happy to talk about this stuff because these are subjects that have to be approached discursively mm -hmm. because Ficino is a node in a giant network of lots and lots and lots of thinkers and ideas that span centuries and centuries. And yeah, you can unpack Ficino from like his immediate lifetime and those kinds of influences, but that's not, why he's significant he's significant for his contributions to this multi-generational you know millennia long tr uh, traditions and i think that's really what makes him fascinating so that's the level at which we need to approach him yeah and um, i think and he's so, also um you know he wrote so much and produced so much that it's difficult for for any of us to really like absorb everything that ficino produced and yeah and, and he changed yeah he so, changed it's um, like it's hard to map those internal changes as well. Yeah, is his eighteen book uh, summa on the Platonic, blah blah blah, is that available in English? Yes. So there is a translation by Allen and Hankins, mm -hmm. and it is in six volumes. So oh, that's easier. It's eight, eighteen books is what Ficino wrote, but that fits into six modern volumes today. Um, okay. I would suggest if you are going to read it, like just maybe get a hold of the first one, see what you think about it. Cause it, 
it might be dry to some people, but then other people might really get a kick out of it. So it's hard to say what people think. It's like, did you enjoy reading uh, Euclid's Elements? If so, then maybe you can proceed. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I think it's time for us to wrap up our episode, which is split into, uh, two, three, four, ten 10 parts, um, due to technology issues. Um, but can you tell people about your translation, your new translation and where to find it? Um, uh, well, you can't find it yet cause it's being peer reviewed. So you'll just have to, uh, we all just have to wait and, and wait. Yeah. So, or you can go and read it in the Latin, you know, um, it's not hard to find a collection of uh, Ficino's complete works on Google Books or archive.org or anything like that. And uh, if you've got the schooling under your belt, you can take a whack at it. <laughs> uh, so I guess then the only thing for people to do is to follow you on Twitter and YouTube and and your website and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Just, yeah, stay tuned because I'm always talking about this kind of stuff and uh, surely I'll be talking about it more. Well, I'm looking forward to the new translation. Thank you so much for coming on. I will make sure, uh, I mean, I think everybody knows that you're the modern hermeticist um, and I'll make sure that there's links to all of your stuff in the show notes and I'll have you on again sometime and maybe next time we'll, uh, you know, jump forward or backwards 75 years and see what's going on. All right. (laughs) All right. Thanks a lot, Eric.